Modern Railways. In-depth railway news. Hello and welcome to the Modern Railways preview for the March 2023 edition. Now, we are still a railway magazine, but my little section has got the superannuated anoraks doing a tour around London on various London Overground, originally titled London Overground. Um, so, we thought we'd do it a little bit different, and rather than just sit on little hard seats all day, we've come on the luxurious Thames Clipper. And uh, we're just about to go through the Thames Barrier. I must say, first impression, brilliant. Nice and warm, maybe a little bit noisy on the train, um, but certainly a pleasant change when you've spent uh, a whole day going out on little suburban trains. Anyway, you can read all about that come the time. First off then, let's see what Roger's got to say for this edition. You know it's going to be interesting. Anyway, here he is. Lead item in this month's uh, Informed Sources is a year-by-year -year analysis of what it's going to take and what has to happen to get great British railways up and running. Uh, central to this analysis is the future of today's uh, train operating companies, the old franchises, how they're transferred to Great British Railways and when, and what will be done needed to procure and let them. Uh, my analysis is that it won't be quick and it won't be easy, and it could take up to the end of the decade. You may have seen the uh, George reports of the George Bradshaw address by Transport Secretary Mark Harper. This included some detail and committed the government to uh, pushing ahead with Great British Railways. Well, I, my, uh, I wrote my piece uh, before that address and having read it, I didn't have to change a single word. Central to the uh, government's aspirations for Great British Railways is a much bigger role for the private sector. They want to bring in uh, pr dynamic thrusting private companies to run the new passenger services, passenger service contracts, which will be let by GBR. Well, I'm not so sure. Uh, I produce a list of the potential runners and riders in 2023 and then look back at the glory days of franchising and who was in the market in 2000 and 2005. And my conclusion is that the government's aspirations are likely to be disappointed. Before we launched Informed Sources 40 years ago, for a few months we ran a, a prototype, as it were, called Ahead of the News. Now, you may have seen reports of this emerging new world of air taxis and electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, aircraft. And a government study looked at the potential for this new uh, form of transport uh, on rail routes where the journey is slow or there isn't a direct uh, or there isn't a direct rail connection. Anyway, I analyse this report, uh, do some sums, uh, review the technology of the uh, of the aircraft involved, and come to a sort of conclusion that mm, perhaps. Anyway, um, no sooner had uh, this article appeared in print for subscribers. Uh, then the Transport Select Committee of the House of Commons announced it was launching a new review into, guess what, the role of electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft in transport. So, as you can see, still ahead of the news after 40 years. Finally, uh, too late for the column, uh, is the very good news that the government, in the form of Great Western Railway, has bought the ass assets of Viva Rail. <clears throat> This includes the intellectual property rights to the uh, advanced battery charging technique, uh, the, uh, the, the five car train that's going to run on the Greenford branch and all of the outstanding unmodified D78 stock. So that's good news. And we could well see Adrian Shooter's vision realised. Thank you, Roger. OK, Roger. Now then, next thing is Philip Sherratt, the editor, who's going to tell us the rest of the news that's in the magazine. Now, of course, I'm recording this when I don't know what he's going to say, but I do know that it's going to be interesting, because he always is. Well, I hope you think so, too. OK, Philip, over to you. Thanks, Ian, and hello again, everyone. So I'm going to start this bump uh, by focusing on our news item, which is our lead cover story, which is about HS2. Many of you will have seen the reports in the media about potential cuts to the project. Um, so what can we add to that story? Well we can um, perhaps shine a light on the uh, truth or otherwise in those media reports, as you can read uh, in the magazine. Uh, but certainly there is some concern that um, HS2 might be cut back. Um, see, what we see what you think about our comment on it in the magazine. 
And that actually um, overtakes, in terms of the lead story, the um, announcement by the Secretary of State in the George Bradshaw address about progress with Great British Railways and rail reform. But we do, of course, report on that. Um, how much that actually makes things clearer, we're not quite sure. Um, Roger is covering his own bit, um, looking to see how it might all pan out. And so he's very much got the detail on that front. Our main features this month are about the West Midlands. Uh, we've got um, quite a good selection. Uh, overview feature looks at general progress and plans for service enhancement. And a lot of that centres around the Midlands Rail Hub and chiefly the uh, long-standing uh, aim to build new cords uh, to allow services to run into more streets from both the um, East Midlands and the South West. And this would uh, create extra capacity at New Street and allow more trains to run overall. And we've got some good schematics showing you how that would all work. We also report on West Midlands train driver recovery plan. Their train crew position was in not a good place, uh, but is now a lot better. And we um, shine the light on how they've done that. In December, Birmingham New Street recycling was completed. The power signal box has now uh, signaled its last train. So we have a report on that. Also on the work of the Grand Rail Collaboration, which is the organisation uh, bringing rail uh, bodies, train operators and local government organisations together in the West Midlands. Uh, I also had an interesting visit to Tarmax plant at Washford Heath, uh, which is on the edge of uh, Birmingham, and you can read about that for a freight angle. And then for something different, we also have a very light rail report. Uh, Coventry is developing a new very light rail system and has just got some funding, which subject to final sign off will allow it to create a demonstration route. And uh, there's also the very light rail innovation centre over at Dudley, which I went to visit uh, towards the end of last year. So a big package of West Midlands features for you. We've also had a lot of new train activity recently, which you can read about. Uh, the Mersey Rail Class 777s from Stadler have gone into service, as have the Transport for Wales Class 231s, also from Stadler. I popped to Beckton Depot to have a look at the new DLR train, the, that's built by CAF, the B23 stock. And we've seen the start of mainline testing for Avanti West Coast Class 805 BIMOs from Hitachi, and also we've got the first pictures of the first completed uh, East Midlands Railway Class 810, also from Hitachi. So lots of new train activity to report on, variously in service, um, unveiled or in testing, and you can read all about that in our various news pages. And another news story worth highlighting is about Eurostar. I went over to Brussels uh, for a day for the new to the new brand following the merger with Tallis, and uh, you can read about their ambitions as part of that. Certainly in the post-COVID, post-Brexit world, it's quite challenging to grow cross-channel traffic, but um, they're, they're, they're being ambitious and um, all power to them. So uh, that's a very whistle-stop tour of what's in the magazine, a packed issue as ever, and lots going on for us to report on. So with that, thanks very much. I wish you well and hand you back to Ian. Thank you, Philip. Now then, the, my panel column, probably dominated, may not be the only feature, but dominated by the superannuated anoraks around me here, um, and our trip around London. We kind of put this off until the winter because, to be honest, if you're looking for a scenic rail trip, this is not the place to come. Um, so, two days looking at the backs of houses. We thought that we'd uh, liven it up a bit by this little trip here, and we can probably see we're just going through the Thames Barrier, which I don't think I've seen up close before, but still. Yes, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the uh, Uber Thames Clipper. Uh, a somewhat luxurious way of getting from Barking Riverside, the new station, which is very impressive. Uh, and we're going down to Battersea, and we'll have a look at what they've done to the power station. After that, we're going to have a little look at uh, the depot at Stewart's Lane. That's not the actual running depot, but the Bellman Pullman area. And uh, we'll be taking a look around that. So that's a bit of a change, isn't it? Um, the trip around London is what you'd expect, really. Quite a lot around London overground. A lot of time spent on uh, transverse seated trains, which might be why I intended to sit looking that way all the time. It's rather interesting going down the wider circle area because, of course, you go over all of the main lines, which normally you're going out of London on these radial routes and you're thinking, oh, where's that go? Well, now we know because we've been on it. And, uh, yeah, there's always things happen on these trips, uh, as you're probably aware, that there'll be a lot of little asides and for instance, we go through Stratford, and who could actually go through Stratford without thinking a little bit about what it used to be like? Well, not me. Okay, so uh, that's it for the preview for the next edition, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for watching. Bye. 
visit www.modernrailways.com for more interesting and essential information about the British Railway Network. Coffee? Oh, cheers. <laughs>